Next is Tom Spot Callaway. Hi. Hi, everybody. Uh, so I have like 20 minutes to get through what's about 45 minutes worth of stuff. So I'm going to talk really fast and try and take some questions at the end. So if you, something sounds really strange, it's because I'm lying, and you can just embrace that and roll with it. Um, is that your official opinion? Yes. Uh, so uh, you can't have a legal talk from somebody that's not a lawyer without having a proper disclaimer. Uh, so I'm not a lawyer. I work with them, but I'm not one. So nothing in this presentation, written or spoken, should be construed as legal advice. If you take it as legal advice, that's on you, not on me. You're screwed. I'm not. Um, while I worked for Red Hat for 16 years now and are occasionally allowed to speak on behalf of my employer, nothing in this presentation represents Red Hat's stance on anything, opinions, ice cream flavors, nothing. So don't go posting about this on Slash. I mean, like, Red Hat said this, because that's not what that means. All right. Though, so, the past. None of these pictures are loaded. Okay, this is going to be less awesome. Let me find the PDF. Half of my presentation is pictures, and thus, uh... And how do I get this to go as a... Thank you. All right. All right, screw that picture. All right, so... In the long, long ago, there was a thing back when dinosaurs roamed the earth called Red Hat Linux. Some of you may be old enough to remember this. Uh, for those of you, I'm sorry. But, uh, but Red Hat Linux was a thing. And then Red Hat decided at some point they didn't want to do Red Hat Linux anymore. They wanted to make money because we weren't making any money. We were selling hats and making more money than we were off of Red Hat Linux. So for all of you who bought a box copy of Red Hat Linux, you made us lose money. Thank you. And... Red Hat developed this all entirely in-house. It was all, yes, it was open source software, but the work that went into it was all done by people that worked at Red Hat. So we would take Apache, we'd bring it in-house, we'd put our patches on it, we'd put it into Red Hat Linux, we'd ship it out the door, and we'd support that. But when we stopped doing Red Hat Linux, we thought we still want to do something like Red Hat Linux, but we want to do it with the community. This is a picture of the actual Fedora community. And we wanted them to be able to have a say on what this new Linux looked like. So this new Linux got called Fedora. And so we took Red Hat Linux and we put it in a cocoon. And we said, it's going to become something beautiful when it comes out of the cocoon. And it came out looking kind of like this. But <laughs> eventually it looks like this. But for right now, in the past, it looks like this. So we have this thing. And we want the opportunity to let the community decide what goes inside of it. And so we say to the community, we say, OK, you have a little more input into what goes in and what doesn't go in, what color things are, what patches are applied to this. We're going to give you some free reign. But we can't just give you complete free reign. So we created this thing. And no one's quite sure who created this. It is lost in the sands of time. But we created a tag in our Bugzilla, which is our bug tracking system. And we said, this is FE legal. FE standing for Fedora for some reason, legal standing for legal for obvious reasons. And if you aren't sure that something should be in Fedora or not, you ought to tag it FE legal. And everyone assumed that someone was looking at this. <laughs> Because when this was in-house, everyone was looking at this, presumably. And, but in reality, it's just more like this lovely black hole with the name FE Legal on top of it. And so at the time, the Fedora project leader kind of asked around the people and said, hey, so somebody should probably look at this black hole and figure out where all these things are going and who's handling them. And when we figured out that no one was handling them, I got volunteered to handle them. <laughs> so... When I started looking at these things and I asked the legal department, I said, what should we do about these 175 open tickets blocking a Bugzilla thing that no one has looked at since they were ever filed during the creation of Fedora? And they said, I don't know. And I said, aren't you the lawyers? Aren't you supposed to be able to tell me what's going on in this? And they were like, well, it's a community thing. You can make the rules. And I was like, really? <laughs> and they were like, yeah, you can. And they're like, but, but maybe you should run those rules past us first. I was like, all right, so we're making rules. I said, rule number one needs to be free software. We thought about making it needs to be open source, but then everything that was open source was free, and some of the stuff that was open source that was non-free was kind of sketchy and weird, and so we were like, all right, screw that. Free software, we're just going to go with that. And then people were like, that's an awesome idea, and then my internet doesn't work. And we were like, huh, well, wireless might be a nice thing for people to have. Because at the time, pretty much every single wireless chipset in existence, except for that one that was in like two laptops in China, needed firmware to be driven. And so we're like, well, we really don't want to be that distribution that everyone used to use says, well, we used to use that before wireless. And, uh, and there was enough 
freeze and freedom distributions that were out there that didn't work on anybody's wireless chipsets that we thought we didn't need to add another one to that collection. So we made it sort of a broad decision as a community that we did want wireless support. So we amended this rule to say it needs to be free software except for firmware that's needed to make free software work. And that has been one of the most controversial points in the history of Fedora, but the fact that everyone on Fedora is using it with wireless today means we probably made the right call. Maybe someday in the future we'll be able to say, hey, all these wireless chipsets don't need this firmware anymore, and we can drop that rule. We'd be very happy to drop it. We're not big fans of it, but that's the biggest bone of contention between Fedora and the Free Software Foundation. So the second thing is, this was when the lawyer showed up and said, can we see a look at that list of rules you're generating? And I said, sure. And they said, it needs to be something that we can actually distribute. And I said, well, what about the community? They're distributing. And then it taught me very clearly that Red Hat is still the legal distributor of this thing that the community made. The community stood around dumping things in the pot and stirring it. And then they handed it to Red Hat and said, give it to the world. And then Red Hat says, I will give it to the world. And so we had to make sure there wasn't like dead bodies in there and stuff. <laughs> And because Red Hat is an American, wait, that's not the right picture for America. Here we go. <laughs> because Red Hat is an American, <laughs> we, uh, we, we have to make sure that we actually comply with US laws as crazy and wacky and stupid as they are. So uh, compliant with US laws, this is things like, you know, say, the DMCA. And yes, the DMCA makes me want to feel just like this on the inside. And no, it makes everybody else feel like this. But we still have to comply with it. So. All right, so this is the rule. has to comply with laws. This includes things like patents. So patents, bad. Red Hat, lots of money. People come and say, hey, want your money, Red Hat? We would like that. And we'd like to not have to do anything legitimate to get that money. So we're going to sue you over patents that we found or we bought or we made up and stuff like that. If you haven't looked through the interesting case uh, law data from the Sun trial in which Sun admitted on the stand that they had a team of employees that were doing nothing other than competing with each other to try to make the worst patents they possibly could. <laughs> Yes, patents, garbage. But we have to step away from that because no one's going to sue Debian. Because if you sue Debian, you will get exactly zero dollars in return, and your lawyer will still have to get paid. <laughs> Whereas Red Hat, if you sue Red Hat and you win, then there's some money in it for you, and Red Hat goes away, and we're all very sad about that because I don't have a job. So we need to not infringe known Red Hat, known patents. Now, I'm being careful with the wording on this because I don't want this to turn into a, well, Spot said we're all good with this and all that sort of stuff. because. I firmly believe that there's a high probability that everything we do, including breathing, is infringing a patent. And so we have to be careful in the, in the way that we act such that we, when we know something is patented, and I will give a specific example, MP3. When we knew MP3 was patented and they told us, hey, this is patented. This is the patent pool. And this is how much it costs to join the patent pool, uh, that we were like, well, I guess that's patented. I guess we can't ship that now. So. The last thing we did was we wanted to make sure the lawyers were very interested in making sure that we respected Red Hat's trademarks. Uh, we, this was in an early sort of proto stage for Fedora in which there was still a lot of the community that wanted to do things like take the Red Hat logo and paint it blue and then say, that's the Fedora logo. And people were like, no, we can't do that. That's not OK. And so when we were thinking about this process, we decided that we wanted to go a step beyond what we were obligated to do by law in Fedora. Because if we want people to respect the Red Hat and the Fedora trademarks, we really want to respect all trademarks. And yes, it is the burden of the trademark holder to come and tell us, hey, stop putting Mario-themed games in your distribution. We decided it would be easier just to have the community say, we're not going to let these sorts of things in. If it's a clear trademark infringement, or if you think it might be trademark infringement, ask, and we'll figure it out, and we'll go from there. And the community has really taken on that pretty well. And we think that that's made it more likely that people are willing to respect the Fedora trademark. Now. We start looking at the, the bulk of these tickets in this black hole. And a lot of them were these license tickets. And what happened was we inherited a lot of packages from Red Hat Linux. Red Hat Linux used to have this thing called Contrib. And Contrib was this FTP server where if you made a package, you could shove it in there, and people would be able to use it against Red Hat Linux. And so when the first thing, when Fedora sort of opened up, a lot of people took these old packages from Contrib and shoved them in there and said, now they're in Fedora, and we all like them. We're happy about this. Because you know it's old decisions like, we're only going to ship SendMail. We're not going to ship any other SMTP demons. And then a whole of these other SMTP demons showed up and they had license tags like distributable. What does that mean? How can I know if that's compatible with something else? And so we started going through. People were like, is distributable an actual license tag? We found one package in Fedora that said something like license OK. And we were like, it looks good to me. Well, let's ship that. So we had all these licenses. And so we had a list of, well, this isn't actually the right picture. This is closer to the right picture. Um, 
the number of licenses we started discovering, we started pulling back and doing audits and sort of tearing into this. And this all didn't happen overnight. This happened over a, a long window of time. So we started generating a list, giving each one of them an identifier and saying these all go in the name. Um, at this point in time, we have more than 350 free licenses that we're tracking in this list, including 16 BSD variants and 34 MIT variants. And quite frankly, I found about five more MIT variants, but I can't stomach putting them in the list anymore, so I've stopped adding them. So. <laughs> So, and then we started saying, okay, now we've got this license list. We've kicked all the obvious garbage out. We've got a standardized way of marking things so people don't write random garbage in the license tag field on packages. And then Red Hat Legal showed up and said, you need to have a CLA on this. And we said, well, we don't really know what you're asking for, but all right, sure. So we set up our whole Fedora infrastructure for contributing around this concept of having a CLA. And then I started noticing as I was getting email to legal at fedoraproject.org that people would be like, I don't understand what I just agreed to, and I'm not comfortable agreeing to this. I really want you to explain this. And what was happening was we also started getting companies that wanted to participate in Fedora as it started being more successful. And they would say things like, I'm not willing to agree to these terms. And I would say, why? And they would say, I'm not willing to agree to these terms. And it was not a very productive arrangement there. Uh, and what finally we boiled down by asking a whole bunch of people that weren't willing to agree is that most of them thought it looked like a copyright assignment, which they were really uncomfortable doing. They didn't want to give Red Hat copyright because they knew Red Hat made money. They didn't know we didn't make any money off Fedora. But the thought was, I gave you something cool. You put it in Fedora. You make a whole bunch of money. I make none of that money because you gave me the copyright. And that wasn't what it was ever intended to do, but enough people were confused by this that we were like, all right, let's redo this. So we created the Fedora Project Contributor Agreement. Richard Fontana, big help with that. And we massively simplified the terms. And we said, look, the only thing we really care about is to make sure that we have what we get from our contributors under a free license. We don't even really care what the free license is. It can be any of the 350 on there. But most of the people who were making contributions were doing it in small little corner areas, nothing too big, nothing too large, but it was still copyrightable. We still wanted to have a safety net, just in case somebody showed up and said, hey, that spec file that I wrote for that package 10 years ago is now under a proprietary license and you owe me money. And so. We set it up such that basically it says, if you give us something and you don't put a license on it, you agree to let us use it under a free license. If it's software, you agree to let us use it on our MIT, super permissive, compatible with everything. If it's content, you agree to let us use it on a Creative Commons license, compatible with everything. And everybody was like, that's cool. I mean, we even got to down to the point where we took this to the federal government. And the government was like, as long as you opt out all federal government employees from having to pretend they own copyright, we're good with it. And we're like, all right, we'll add 10 more lines of legalese to this. So. Uh, that was where we got to. And in the course of the life of Fedora, we've accomplished a couple of really interesting things. We were responsible for fixing the SGI freebie license, making XORG finally free. One of the dirty little secrets of XORG is that it had this giant chunk of code inside of it that was non-free. And everyone knew about it. Debian knew about it. Gentoo knew about it. Everybody knew about it. But everybody was just like, yeah, we kind of like having graphics. So we're going to keep going with this. And we just finally pushed through until they, they, they triggered the clause in the freebie license, the or later clause. And they said the MIT is actually version 3 of the SGI freebie. Be. And so everybody triggered over to MIT and all that went away. Uh, we convinced Sun to drop the nuclear clause for most of their Java licensing, making it actually free because it had clauses like you can't use this on a nuclear submarine. Not that we really wanted Java on a nuclear submarine to start with, really. But uh, And then we relicensed most of the Artistic One only modules in CPAN uh, and dropped from Fedora what we couldn't fix, which was about five. Most of the vast majority of them were like, oh, that license isn't what you like. We'll move to the new one or we'll just move to the same license as the rest of Perl. And so that you know, six months of my life, I'll never get back. But we got a lot of that done. Uh, we also worked with Tech Live uh, to identify and remove all the non-free components. Uh, uh, Tech Live is like an onion that you keep peeling back layers, and you keep peeling back, and keep peeling back, and keep peeling back. And then you, so there's a guy from 1983 living inside there. And he's like, could you put those back? I'm in here. So <laughs> we went through and identified all the non-free components inside Tech Live, which took forever. And then the, and upstream, I had this great email in my uh, archives that says basically is one of the head maintainers of the time from Tech Live. And he said, do I really have to get rid of these things? Yes, you really have to get rid of these things. So you're welcome. Uh, we also helped a lot of smaller projects to resolve licensing issues. People started to recognize that, hey, Fedora is not messing around with this license stuff. And they started coming to us and saying, I wrote this new license, and I think it might be. And I'll be like, stop. Don't do that. And uh, we got a lot of those fixed. We worked with them to resolve compatibility issues. And uh, we also fixed a lot of fonts. There was a lot of fonts that were out there that were in common use that were just not under free licenses. And a lot of times, we were the first people that had ever asked this font author, hey, is there any chance you'd be willing to put this under a free license? And he was like, oh, that matters to you? OK, sure, whatever. And, we, and this was just like Debian had kicked half the fonts out at one point. And we just went through and asked every single one of them. And they were like, sure, whatever. So 
And then we also centralized the Fedora trademarks in one package. We knew that people wanted to be able to take Fedora and rebrand it and respin it and do all sorts of stuff with it. And so we said, all right, fine, let's make it easy for people to do that. If that's what they really want, let's make their lives easy. So we took all the Fedora trademarks, we got rid of all the Red Hat trademarks, and we put them all in one package and said, hey, you delete this package. We even made a package that replaces this one that has no trademarks in it. And it was originally intended as like a template, but people were like, hey, now I have generic Linux. And we're like, oh, oh OK, generic Linux, eh? that's what you wanted. <laughs> so here it brings us to the present. So uh, these locks represent cryptography. And because I couldn't think of anything else better to represent cryptography, but uh, we spent a lot of time trying to get ECC back into Fedora because we know a lot of you don't like the NSA reading your email. And we thought it would be nice if we covered as much as we could. And so this is a long, drawn out process to determine when the Red Hat legal team would be comfortable with this going in. The net result is today in Fedora, we have all the curves in Suite B plus SecP 521R1, 256K1, which is the Bitcoin. Uh, curve, uh, the ED25519 curve, which was never encumbered by anything, just nobody ever asked about it, uh, and then this P2214. Uh, this took six years for the base functionality to come in and 10 for all the curves. So it's one of those things where it's just having to convince people that yes, these things are not as risky as you think they might be, and then some things happen in those space that made them less risky over time. But needless to say, Fedora has ECC now, so that's a better thing for us. And then music. Music's another big thing. Uh, people have been asking us, why don't we have MP3 for years? It was because it was obviously patented. The patent holder was making a lot of noise about charging everybody for patents. They were raiding conferences and stealing MP3 players that hadn't paid for the patent licenses. So uh, we finally were able to enable decoding functionality because enough of the patents in that pool expired. And uh, encoding is still legally problematic because there's still unexpired patents in that space. I can say all of these things because they have a very public, very obvious patent pool. You can go on their website and see exactly which patents are still alive. The Red Hat desktop team did a lot of the work on this too. It's one of those projects where we've been tracking it on and off ever since they told us to take MP3 out. Fun fact, I have a lot of dates on my calendar for when patents expire and it triggers little alarms and so some days I'll wake up and a patent will be expired like, oh, it's going to be a good day. We can add something to Fedora. <laughs> so people always ask me, what's coming in the future? So these are a couple things I'm coming, hoping to see in the future. Uh, S3TC, uh, yeah, that patent that makes it so that when you try to install Steam on Fedora and it installs all happy and then none of your games work, S3TC. So uh, that patent expires on October 2nd, and so that's another alarm on my calendar, super pumped about. Uh, MPEG-1 video, we're investigating that, see if that's a possibility because that is old, 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 and we think there's a very low likelihood that there's anything still infringing in that space. And because MPEG-1 video and MPEG-2 audio are so closely tied together, we think we're probably able to get both of them at the same time. Uh, G729 Audio uh, is telecom codec. Uh, they Earlier this week, the patent pool holder released a statement saying that uh, enough of the patents had expired, that any patents that were still in the space, they weren't sure even existed, but that they were releasing the rest of them under a royalty-free license. And so we should be able to get that in cleanly. But again, all these things have to go through proper processes, so I can't just go and just commit. Uh, SPDX, uh, Fedora has been talking about that for a while. Um, upstream adoption is vital for the full chain of trust for the SPDX complete. Uh, that's not happening yet. And we'd love to see that happening, but it didn't happen yet. So we support you. Good work. Keep it up. We'd love to be there. Uh, but we're considering the value of adopting the SPDX license identifiers and the Fedora packaging metadata. A couple of the other distributions have already done that. Uh, the biggest problem for us is that we have so many BSD and MIT variants, and this is going to make it really hard for us to go through. We're going to have to do a package by package, file by file audit of every single thing in Fedora to make that accomplished. And quite frankly, this is why I drink. So uh, that's a whole bunch of Fedora legal history, past and present, and a tiny little presentation. Are there any questions about anything I can answer about Fedora for you? I'm happy to take them now. What do you drink? So <laughs> many things. <laughs> All right, if you have any Fedora legal questions, I can be found at legal at fedoraproject.org. You feel free to send me. I will not help you with your divorce. But other than that, I would be oh, happy oh, come to on. help you people, out. People must have a question. Yes, I knew there was a question. Yes. This is not core your, your presentation, but do you have a shared copy of your patent expiry calendar that you, uh, that you publicly keep? <laughs> <laughs> You're not the first person to have asked that question. I, uh, I, I, asked, I asked Red Hat at one point about that, and they were like, don't you do that. Oh, okay. That is a bad idea. <laughs> so, uh, so no, sorry. All right, fair enough. Thank you. <laughs> All right, thank you. Enjoy fast time. Thank you very much. <laughs> I, I do have a